offer uh, a brief word of summary at the conclusion of this course, Christian Theology and Tradition. We began this course reflecting upon uh, the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth, the first century Jew from Palestine, all of his activities, his, his ministry, his healings, his teachings, his parables, of course, his death, resurrection, and ascension. We've talked about the way in which that was uh, experienced by the earliest disciples, understood, and then textualized in what we now call the New Testament, the way in which both Jesus and the New Testament uh, found as their precursor and as their context of meaning what we now call the Old Testament scriptures. Um, we talked later in the course about how those scriptures were organized into various canons uh, by the church. We talked about, of course, the key characters that just said Jesus of Nazareth and what became dense, deep, and profound re reflection upon his person and work. Uh, and for that, we have the word Christology, the study of Christ, the study of his person and work. We reflected upon the way in which Jesus' person and work was received in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth century and beyond. We reflected upon uh, the major councils uh, most of which had to do, obviously, with who is Jesus of Nazareth? How does the eternal Son of God relate to the human being, first century Jew, Jesus of Nazareth? How can uh, the Christian church affirm both his equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and yet at the same time his total assumption of humanity? And how can they articulate that union of two natures, divine and human in one person, and in and as the divine human, Jesus of Nazareth. And how can the early church articulate the way in which that now resurrected, crucified and resurrected human being is intrinsic to the one God, the second person of the Trinity, and so on. Profound philosophical, theological, and historical issues surrounding the origins and the development of Christology. We discussed that, obviously, it takes a huge um, position in any discussion of Christian theology and tradition. But we discussed not just the seven councils, but far beyond into the uh, medieval period. Uh, of course, before that, the split between East and West, and then into the medieval period, and then into the Renaissance, the Reformation, the post-Reformational period, on into the modern period, discussing... Uh, both the history, the tradition, as it were, of the Christian faith and its struggles, its triumphs, its uglinesses, its beauties, um, and of course the ideas which characterized the Christian faith theology. Um, we discussed things like uh, doctrines of eschatology, heaven, hell, and so on, doctrines of soteriology, what it ha what is the mechanism by which human beings are put right with God, justification, etc. Um, but of course, as we bring this whole course to a close, one tends to wonder, Christian theology, thoughts about God and about how Jesus of Nazareth, the first century Jew, is now intrinsic to the one God, the second person of the Trinity. Okay, tradition, all this stuff that's happened before I was here, and what does it all mean? Um, but as we reflect not just upon what has happened, what was, um, and what is, um, one wants to, at the conclusion of a course, reflect upon, so what? What does it mean for the church and the world today? Um, and I would argue, as would many, that it's not just that, in the first century, the key moments of Jesus' life that initiated a movement and the fact that his very earliest followers, as a matter of historical fact, claimed that he was crucified and raised from the dead. It's not just that that's a fascinating piece of first century history. It's also that some of the greatest minds in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and beyond, all, all the way to today, greatest minds um, in the world as we know it uh, became engrossed in the world of Christian theology, and it profoundly shaped them. They profoundly shaped not just their world, but the world at large, the world of philosophy and politics and economics, etc. 
It's had a huge impact in terms of history. And of course, not just the great minds, but the great hearts of the Christian faith and how they have had huge impacts in, in, in the world at large. Um, whether one wants to go all the way back to St. Francis of Assisi or one wants to refer to Mother Teresa and the wonderful and, and breathtaking work that she has done. Um, it, it simply is the case that Christian theology and tradition has shaped the world, the whole world, not just the United States, shaped the whole world in ways which are both profound and almost unquantifiably uh, large and, and, and wide-ranging and far-reaching, such that, such that it's not just that Christian theology and tradition is a thing of the past, and it's not just that, it's something that gives, again, unquantifiable shape and color to the present, even in parts of the world that are reacting against Christian theology and tradition. It's shaping it there, too, in that antithetical way. But that it is shaping all of us, whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, and it will continue probably to shape the world in ways which we will be far better and far wiser and far more prepared to be productive, uh, rich, and fruitful members of society, whatever path that we choose to take, if we commit ourselves better to understanding Christian theology and tradition. All the best to you as you wrap up this course.